All right, hello everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, so today we're gonna to start our unit three lecture on energy. Uh, and energy is mostly gonna be driven by chemical reactions. So the start of this unit, we're gonna talk about chemical reactions in general, but also a very important part of chemical reaction, which are catalysts, which comes in the form of enzymes. So as I said before, chemical reactions are necessary for all functions of life, especially when it applies to energy generation, which is what this unit mostly focuses on. So a real basic type of chemical reaction that you should all be familiar with is cellular respiration. So in this case, we have a chemical reaction. And if you're not familiar with what a chemical reaction is, it just means we're rearranging molecules and atoms. We have glucose and oxygen, and then we rearrange those atoms into carbon dioxide and water. And during that rearrangement, we're gonna release some of the energy that's in this glucose for the organism to use. Now, Usually when we talk about this, we usually think that the energy released uh, just comes out of the bonds and that's it. But that's not always the case because what we need to do is we actually need to invest energy in order for this chemical reaction to occur. So chemical reactions don't typically occur spontaneously. We have to invest a little bit of energy that we have in order to make those chemical reactions begin in the first place. Now the energy that you have to put into a chemical reactions reactants in order to make it work, we refer to this as the activation energy. It's the amount of energy you need to activate the chemical reaction. So if we think back to our glucose and oxygen into carbon dioxide and water example here, uh, here we have our reactants, which is glucose and oxygen. We have to put in some activation energy, which is represented here in order to eventually get to a lower energy state with our products. And the difference between the reactants and the products is gonna be the energy that is released to the environment. And this is energy that we can take advantage of, okay? Now you'll notice that the difference between the reactants and the products has delta G. Well, that is just called Gibbs free energy. And it's just a measurement of how much energy is released into the local environment that we as organisms uh, can use in order to uh, you know, break down other molecules or move things across the membrane or whatever we need to do with that energy going forward. Now, paying that activation energy over and over and over and again uh, can be very taxing. Energy is hard to come by in nature. Uh, I mean, as humans, we get a pretty good amount of food available to us. We're very lucky. But typically uh, in ecosystems or in life, you want to be as energy efficient as possible. That way, if you come upon lean times, you're able to still carry out the processes that you need to. Well, luckily in our cells, there are things known as catalysts and catalysts are any substances that can speed up a chemical reaction. In organisms, this is gonna be referred to as enzymes. And what enzymes do is they're essentially gonna be able to reduce the amount of activation energy that we have to put in to our chemical reactions in order to make them occur. So here, as you see in the beginning, this is our substrates, also known as our reactants. And we're going to convert atom A and molecule BC into molecule AB and into atom C. So in order to make that happen, first we have to invest energy to break all the bonds. So you can see we've put in our activation energy, all of the atoms are separate, and then energy is released and they form a lower energy variant, which is A and B together with C. So here you can see the amount of activation energy we had to put in in order to make it work. Now, what enzymes do is they're going to take this atom A and this molecule BC or whatever reactants we're working with, and they're gonna put them into a more favorable state, which means they're going to arrange them uh, in a way in which the activation energy is lowered. So we're still doing the same reaction, we're still getting the same amount of energy out of it, but the amount of energy we have to input into the chemical reaction is being reduced, which is gonna be highly beneficial to any organism. Now, enzymes are typically proteins and they are gonna consist of an active site that the substrates or the reactants are going to bind to. So here's our enzyme down here. You'll notice that there's an active site. The reactants or the substrate will bind to that active site and then the enzyme will cause the chemical, or not cause it, but it'll reduce the activation energy for that reaction to occur and then release the products. Okay, so you'll notice that the substrate is the same shape as the enzyme's active site. Uh, that is one of the ways that enzymes can distinct 
uh, uh, not distinct, but distinguish between different substrates in order to make sure it's only carrying out the chemical reaction that it wants to. So shape being one of the ways and charge, which we'll talk about later, being another. Oh, look, oh, there we go. <laughs> so as I said before, uh, enzymes use shape and charge in order to create a what we call a lock and key model in that only certain reactants and substrates can only react with certain enzymes. So this allows your body to control the type of chemical reactions that it wants to happen based on the enzymes that it's going to produce through protein synthesis, which we'll talk about more in unit six. Now, typically, um, it's not going to be a perfect fit, right? Uh, typically what happens is enzymes will have something called an induced fit where the substrate will actually go into the active site and the active site will kind of morph a little bit around it. A really good metaphor or analogy for this would be like when you put on a glove. So a glove is like roughly this like shape of your hand, right? And when you put it in there, the glove will kind of expand and form fit to your hand. Uh, enzymes are kind of the same way. So the substrate will go in, it'll kind of form around it, decrease the activation energy, release the products. Now, almost all chemical reactions in the cell are gonna be carried out by enzymes because it's just more energy efficient and that's gonna be selected for in evolution. Now, you can always tell what an enzyme is based on the fact that they usually end in ASE. So something like kinase would be an enzyme. Uh, proctase, lactase, these are all enzymes because they end in ASE. Now, typically enzymes don't work alone. They're not very isolated. They typically work in uh, tandem with other enzymes in order to perform several chemical reactions in order to build a final product. So here you can see we start with our substrates. Uh, we'll wait for it to loop back around. But we start with our substrates, and these substrates go to enzyme 1. And then the product of enzyme 1 combines with another substrate and enzyme 2. And then the product of enzyme 2 combines with another substrate in order to make enzyme 3. And then you have this fully complex finished product in the end. And here you can see kind of the chemical uh, steps in between that. So we have substrate tyrosine. Uh, becomes dopa, becomes dopa quinine. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but whatever. Uh, and then eventually the final product made by enzyme three is melanin, which is used by your skin uh, for certain UV defense mechanisms. So we can see uh, we have multiple products and substrates along the way, and eventually we form our final product through multiple enzyme interactions. All right, uh, and that's where we're going to leave it for today, no FRQ, but we will have a quiz tomorrow. So I will see you all then for the quiz.